Hello everyone, Cole here and welcome back to the channel. Today I'm going to be covering everything you could want to know about crafting for the Lizard Cult. We are going to need to talk about how to set up. Our setup is going to prioritize clearings that we're able to reinforce and score using the cards in our hand. So if we can also use those clearings to craft, that's a nice bonus, but it's not our priority. So we're not really going to consider crafting when setting up unless we have two options that are equal in terms of scoring potential but one has a bit of crafting potential as well it would sort of be a, a tiebreaker rather than the initial criterion so that brings us to should we score or craft with our cards uh, unless it would put us in the lead we're going to need to be taking the score action whenever possible to stay competitive. And the reason I say unless it would put us in the lead is because as the lizards we want to try and avoid heat from the rest of the table. It is very hard for us to build back up after we get knocked down uh, by having our gardens removed from the map from our opponents. So we need to be scoring to stay close but not in the lead. Crafting is almost always secondary to scoring, and I'm saying this because we need the points, right? We just need to keep getting points, and so uh, we're going to want to make use of our dominance swapping as well so that we don't have to score using a high-value craftable, right? So say we, we need to score, right? The only uh, card we can score with is a coins card. Say it's rabbit suited. And we want to be able to craft this coins card late in the game, right? Because we have our two rabbit gardens. Those can be used to craft coins. The outcast doesn't match this turn, but we do want to craft those coins later in the game. So we don't want to spend them to score now. So we can take our bird dominance, if we have it in our hand, or any other bird card, and take that bird card, exchange it for the rabbit suited dominance that is in the supply. Hopefully it is in the supply. Then we can use that rabbit dominance to then score two points with our gardens or maybe more if we have more uh, rabbit gardens. Unlikely but possible. If we don't need to score or influence the outcast with this card we are going to want to craft it because we're going to be drawing multiple cards a turn and we're going to frequently exceed the hand limit because we spend a score but not much else right so if we have if we have uh, two suits of scoring available to us that means we're going to be drawing three cards per turn and we're going to be scoring with two cards maximum per turn so we might not always be able to score in, in both suits every turn so we're, we're getting a net gain of one every turn minimum could be getting more so we're gonna exceed that hand limit and have to discard we are beholden to the dragon god and what do i mean by that I mean that we can only craft using clearings matching the outcast suit. So we do need to be mindful of which suits we discard when we do exceed our hand limit. But we also need to be aware of which suits others are likely to discard. Uh, keep an eye out for something like an impending eerie turmoil, right? So if the eerie are if there is a planned eerie turmoil from the table that is about to go down. Take note of which suits are in their decree because they're going to be discarded when the Eerie cannot fulfill the decree on their turn. And then they will enter the Lost Souls and influence your outcast. When the Woodland Alliance spreads sympathy, keep an eye on which clearings are less defended, which clearings don't have martial law that are adjacent to their current sympathy where they can be spreading to because then that suit will likely be adding to the Lost Souls unless they spread using only bird supporters. Uh, and also keep an eye out for when a base is looking lightly defended and there's something like a warlord in the game or commander eerie or a faction with partisans that could reliably take advantage with guaranteed hits and remove that base if Woodland Alliance is a threat because then they will have to discard all matching supporters of that base. If the moles have swayed banker, this is one that is, it's less... Uh, simple to try and calculate which suit is going to be affected here, which which suit is going to be added to, um, because if they have Swayed Banker, they're probably, I don't know, discarding one or two cards for Banker, and then they're drawing a couple cards with Markets, 
and so you don't know exactly what suits are in their hand, but they do reveal their cards, so you have at least some information on which suits are in their hand, so keep that in mind. Uh, when the cats use field hospitals, if there's a critical clearing that you know the cats are going to want to defend, and you know that uh, maybe an opposing Eerie is trying to break through there because the next turn they're going to need to move uh, past that clearing to build, and cats are definitely going to want to be field hospitaling whenever they can to keep those warriors on the board, make note of those clearings. And, and this is a lot of information. Um, I'm just trying to come up with every instance uh, where we as the Lizards player are able to kind of predict what cards are going to be spent and discarded by other players. If the Otters overdraw, uh, you can't really um, you can't really predict this one, but it's just another one that I, I thought should be listed, right? I'm just trying to list any any time that players can be discarding cards outside of just hand limit shenanigans. I don't know why I said shenanigans. They're not shenanigans. It's just your regular hand limit. That was weird. Um, moving on. Uh, Badgers recruiting. So Badgers spend one card to place two warriors. They can do that as many times as they want, matching their way stations. So if there's a way station that you know they're going to want to recruit at in order to move out and then recover on that same turn, or if there's only one suit they can recruit in this turn, there's a good chance that they're going to be spending a couple cards of that suit on their turn. Anyone that has partisans, they will have to discard their entire hand except for cards that match that suit when they activate that partisans card. And nothing is guaranteed. We're never guaranteed an outcast suit. So we're going to just want to craft it while we have the chance, except maybe an early T or hammer. If the Vagabond or Warlord are in the game, we don't want to give them more actions early in the game. Later in the game, it's fine, but early on, we probably want to avoid this. So you might be wondering, can I do more than just discard responsibly? And the answer to that is yes. A few of the items listed on the previous slide can be triggered by us, right? So we can cause an eerie turmoil, we can sanctify a Woodland Alliance base, something like that. Um, in addition to that, though, we can force opponents to discard a card of our preferred suit if we have Saboteurs crafted. And that's nice because Saboteurs is a very easy card for us to craft. It's also just a very useful card to have crafted. If we have two equally savvy crusade targets, we are going to want to pick the one that matches our preferred outcast suit as the tiebreaker there. Because if we get ambushed, at least it's going to sway the outcast in our favor. And ideally we can do this with a bird counter ambush, so if our opponent tries to ambush us, we can say, nope, I'm going to counter ambush with a bird, that way the outcast goes in the direction we want and we don't lose any warriors for the trouble. And if, if we're against the cat specifically, if they do field hospital those warriors that we remove in a crusade, it will benefit us. And that would be the same for converting any warriors in cat clearings, any cat warriors in clearings that match the suit of the outcast we want, because they might field hospital them, and then influence the outcast for us. The exception to this would be if the clearing contains a badger way station. Maybe we don't want to destroy that badger way station because we want them to spend those cards. Of course, there are plenty of situations where you need to wipe the badgers off the board. Um, usually that doesn't fall on the lizards, but maybe you, you, the table's going to do it anyway, and it's it's weakened at this point. You just want the, to, the free cardboard point. Absolutely fine. Um, but I would say just in general, um, we don't want to destroy that badger way station if it's in the suit we want because they're going to be spending those cards for us. We can also craft an item in order to avoid having to discard an undesirable suit. So if we really don't want the outcast to be Fox, um, and we're going to be discarding this turn, but the Fox card that we'd probably be discarding is Informants, rather than hold on to Informants, which we don't really want anyway, uh, say we have, I don't know, two other Fox cards in our hand that we're going to be scoring with on the coming turns, and Informants just, you know, it's not that great of a card, so we'd probably discard it. I might as well just craft it if it matches our outcast, and we, which is currently Fox, but we don't want it to be Fox next turn. Some kind of hypothetical like that. 
that was a bit messy because I don't have anything explicitly written out, but I think you can get the idea of what I'm trying to say there. So now we can move into the actual cards themselves. We'll just do a quick overview of the items here. We have four copies of both bags and boots of one of each suit. We have three copies of coins, one of each suit excluding the bird. Two copies of crossbow, we have a mouse and a bird suit. Three copies of root T, uh, one of each suit excluding bird. Three copies of sword, one of each suit excluding rabbit. And then the one fox suited hammer card. So now we can talk about some crafted improvements. We're gonna start here with swap meat, which costs one rabbit crafting piece. Once in birdsong, we may take a random card from another player and then give them a card. So swap meat is another chance to get a card that we can score with, which is always nice. And we can also use it before performing any conspiracies. So we might want to adjust our plan according to the card we get from swap meat. So that's always nice. We can try making deals with opponents, right? So there are a lot of factions that want bird cards. We want specific suited cards. So maybe the cats want a bird card. You say, hey cats, you want a bird card? How many mouse cards do you have in your hand? Of course, you do still have to take the card at random. They can't just give you a mouse card. But if, they, if their hand is primarily made up of mouse cards, they can let you know, and then you hopefully get a mouse card, and then you give them a bird card in return. This is one of the few cards that I would say we should consider crafting instead of scoring with if we do have to make that decision, but only in the early game because we're gonna get that return from it every turn. Late in the game, probably not. Uh, I'd say just score with it, get those two points. Moving on, we have Corvid Planners, which is two of any suited crafting piece. While moving, you ignore rule. This is gonna allow crusades that don't involve moving to or from clearings with our gardens, which is pretty nice. We could pick off an easy cardboard point or two if opponents forget we have it, which they very well might since we don't move very often as the lizards, which makes it niche. But if we're not crafting anything else this turn and we're going to discard it, we might as well craft it because it's pretty easy to craft for us. We're gonna have it's likely that we're going to have the crafting ability required for this. We probably have two suits where we can score in, and so there's two-thirds of the time we'll be able to craft it. And maybe we'll even have the ability to score in all three suits, and then we can just craft this card no matter what. It also won't affect the outcast as a bird card, so we're not going to discard it to affect the outcast. Another reason to just craft it anyway. And the same is going to go for any other bird card. I'm not going to say it for every single bird card, uh, unless we are going to absolutely need that for a dominant swap. So just know that goes for every bird card in this deck and in the rest of the deck, but I'm just not going to mention it every time. Murine Broker, one copy in the deck. Oh, sorry, I haven't been mentioning the number of copies. I'm going to have the number of copies listed in the top there, in parentheses. There's one copy of Corvid Planners, two copies of Swap Meat. Murine Broker costs two mouse crafting pieces. Whenever another player crafts an item, draw a card. So we're never gonna wanna pass up free cards because each card is an action we can take. So we normally have five cards in our hand. If we can start our hand with six, seven cards, that's a great turn. It's going to allow us the potential for more than five actions on our turn, which is very, very nice as the lizards. At a certain point, we might run out of things to use those cards for because we can only score once per suit per turn. And the warrior supply, while large, we have 25 warriors, it is finite, so we might get to a, a point in the game where we have all of our warriors on the board. No one really cares enough to interact with us because we're scoring at a slow and steady pace, and we can't catch them just by scoring those gardens every turn, so they're just not interacting, so the warriors aren't coming off the board, we just keep recruiting them on. But we can still make use of these extra cards when discarding to influence the outcast, which will be helpful for getting those crafting points we're going to need to get a burst turn at the end of the game and close out a win. Never pass up free cards, just gonna emphasize that again. So even though we might run out of things to use the cards for specifically, we should never just pass up the free cards. And it's pretty easy for us to craft Murine Broker because we're, if we're having crafting pieces in uh, mouse clearing, we're gonna have two of them, right? Because we're gonna wanna be scoring. And that doesn't 
really go for most factions. So that's one nice thing about it as well. League of Adventurous Mice, two copies in the deck, costs one mouse crafting piece. Once in daylight, may exhaust an item in your crafted items box to take a move or initiate a battle. Moving and battling independent of the outcast suit is incredibly valuable for us. Usually we're limited by our crusade, which is tied to the outcast. We can take this action after revealing all of our cards, which is useful for a, a few things. We can use this to preserve our hand if we need to remove any sympathy from clearings with our gardens. Right, All of our cards are revealed, they're on the table, which means they're not in our hand, which means we effectively have an empty hand, and the Woodland Alliance draws from the deck instead of taking a card from our hand. And also, if we happen to have Partisans crafted, we can uh, take a battle that makes use of Partisans without having to discard any cards. Now, this is an extremely rare interaction because it requires us to have League of Adventurous Mice crafted. It requires us to have an item in our crafted items box, which is going to be dependent on us being able to have the correct outcast suit to craft said item. It's going to require us to have the correct partisan suit. And all three of those are going to have to happen. So that's it's going to it's incredibly niche, but I thought I'd list it because it's a nice cool little interaction there. You can just use partisans for completely free. And let's move on to false orders, which we have two copies of in the deck costs one fox crafting piece. In Birdsong, may discard this card to move half of an enemy's warriors rounded up from any clearing as if you were that player ignoring rule. So we can use this to move warriors into an outcast clearing so that they can be converted. That's pretty nice if we want to get warriors in a specific clearing in an enemy backline. We can move those warriors into the clearing that matches the suit that we need to convert with this turn. We can also use false orders to trap enemy warriors in our gardens. However, I wouldn't uh, advise doing this in certain situations. I think I cover that in the next bullet point. Sorry about that. If they don't rule any adjacent clearings, their only way to escape is going to be by giving us acolytes through battle. That's their only way to escape. They're going to need to battle us to get out of the clearing, to get at those gardens. But hopefully they never do that. So we shouldn't try this unless our gardens are well defended. And well defended, it depends on the faction you're defending against, right? Like, if it's Woodland Alliance, five warriors is pretty well defended. If it's, I don't know, the Warlord, well, the Warlord can't be moved with false orders. If it's the Commander Eerie, eh, probably not, right? So, eh, that depends. But we shouldn't try unless our gardens are well defended, because losing the gardens probably isn't worth getting a few acolytes in most cases. Can be discarded before the adjust outcast step, which is a really neat little interaction. So false orders is just in birdsong, and adjust outcast is the first step of our birdsong, but we can discard false orders before that to influence the outcast towards fox, if we want it to be fox, or just towards a tie, if we want it to be the same outcast as it was on our previous turn. Can also be discarded between the adjust outcast and discard lost soul steps, which are sequential, but they're separate actions, so we can insert our false orders in between those two steps. If we don't want the outcast to be fox, if we don't want this card to influence the outcast at all, we can adjust the outcast, play false orders, then discard lost souls. Tunnels, two copies in the deck. Oh, and I, I should credit uh, that last part uh, was directly from, I remember watching Nitro Rev's video about false orders. If you are watching me and haven't seen Nitro Rev somehow, definitely go check him out. I'll link his channel in the description. Uh, but he does mention that neat little interaction in his video about false orders. Tunnels, two copies in the deck. We have one rabbit crafting piece uh, to craft it. You treat clearings with any of your crafting pieces as adjacent. Ideally, our matching gardens are built in the same clearing. And so, our crafting pieces are only those gardens that match the outcast suit, so this effect will almost never be applicable, right? In an ideal scenario, you set up in a clearing with two building slots, and you build two gardens of that suit, and you don't build gardens of that suit anywhere else on the board. Uh, so, tunnels is pretty much never going to come into play. And on top of that, we don't move very often, so even when it does apply, we're probably not going to be moving that turn. So, you know, not a very useful craft for us. Eerie Emigre, one copy in the deck, costs two fox crafting pieces. At the end of Bird Song, take a move, then initiate a battle in the clearing you moved into. If you did not take both actions, discard this card. 
So this gives us moves and battles independent of the outcast, which as we already covered with League of Adventures Mice is very good. Uh, and this gives us both of them every single turn. This is going to give us the ability to reposition warriors, which is incredibly useful because we just don't get to do that as lizards pretty much. It's expensive to do so with Crusade. But we do need to plan carefully though, because if our only valid moves at the end of Birdsong are going to be from poorly defended gardens, it could hurt us more than help us because we, we're just forced to move one lizard out of the clearing, take a meaningless battle just so we don't have to discard our Eerie Emigrate card. Uh, that being said though, uh, the benefits of this card massively outweigh any downsides in my opinion, and so we can also completely mitigate these downsides if we just plan around using Eerie Emigre at the end of our next bird song when we're taking our daylight rituals. So we're going to want to recruit in clearings adjacent to gardens so that we can move into them, if we can also battle there in those gardens, of course. But uh, that just gives us an, a nice little safety net that we can use if there's something like a Woodland Alliance Sympathy in there. Yeah, sure, you have to move in and then battle it and pay two cards potentially if, you, if they match, but it's still better than uh, giving up those gardens. And if you have any bird cards in your hand, you don't really care about those unless you were planning on using them to dominant swap this turn. So, you know, it's not the end of the world. The end of the world would be having that revolt take place and your gardens removed. We can consider trying to rule a clearing without building any gardens so that we can avoid weakening our gardens when we have to move out for a battle, right? Because we do need to move, rule either the clearing that we are moving from or the clearing that we are moving to when taking that move action. If the worst comes to worst, like I said, we can move one warrior from a poorly defended garden to avoid discarding the card, but we don't want to have to do that, so we are going to want to plan around this card once we craft it. And I would just like to say that if you are enjoying the video so far, or if you found it helpful, or both, uh, to just take a minute and leave a like on the video, uh, it means a lot to me, and it lets YouTube know that other people might find this video useful, and then it will recommend it to more people. So uh, I appreciate it. Thanks a lot for watching. Let's move on to Charm Offensive. One copy in the deck, costing one rabbit crafting piece. At the start of evening, may draw a card and choose another player to score one point. This gives us more control over which suits are in our hand. We can attempt to negotiate giving points in exchange for leaving our gardens alone. Moving on, we have Master Engravers here, one copy in the deck, costing us two mouse crafting pieces. Whenever you craft an item, score one extra point. So this card doesn't have any guaranteed return on investment. We need to draw items, and then we need those items to match the outcast. If we have one mouse garden, we likely have a second, so there is significantly lower opportunity cost compared to other factions. The same thing I was talking about with Murian Broker. Propaganda Bureau, one copy in the deck, three of any suited crafting pieces to craft. Once in daylight, may spend a card to remove an enemy warrior from a matching clearing and place a warrior there. So we can spend a card to take an action we are already capable of performing. No thanks, we need those cards for actions. On top of this, we normally don't have more than two gardens of any given suit, so I don't think there's really any scenario where I would craft Propaganda Bureau, unless I like, oh, I don't know, it's tough, because we, we have to craft it in the evening, right? So we need to be anticipating needing it on the next turn, which is very hard to do. Um, but if there's a specific scenario where it comes up, maybe, maybe it could happen, I just don't see it. So I, I think this is just a spend it for scoring type of card. Partisans, three copies in the deck, one of each suit. In battle, in matching clearings, may deal one extra hit, then discard all of your cards except those that match the clearing. So discarding cards before our daylight phase is terrible, and our battles are going to be in birdsong, so this is bad. Uh, it can be used after revealing all of our cards if we also have League of Adventurous Mice crafted, like I mentioned, so that's a neat little interaction. We could consider crafting it to avoid having to discard it for Sue, or to deny other factions the partisan card that matches our gardens, because we don't want those to be destroyed. And we, and it's also just a nice little deterrent. Um, they probably think you won't use it, but they'll have to at least 
factor in that little extra consideration when uh, you're the defender and you have that partisan's card crafted. Informants, two copies in the deck, two fox crafting pieces. In evening, if you would draw cards, you may instead take one ambush card from the discard pile. We want to draw as many cards as we can to enable our rituals. This is another why not craft, right? We already have two gardens and fox, the outcast is fox's turn. Why not just craft this informants? Um, we're not going to need to score next turn, we have other fox cards. If we can't dom swap and need a card of a specific suit, we can guarantee we draw that suit if the corresponding ambush is in the discard pile, so that's a nice uh, thing we could use it for. But we're not going to be crafting it specifically for that, it's just going to be another why not type of deal. And that's a lot of the crafted improvements for the lizards are like that. Um, a lot of factions don't have the ability to just why not craft things that cost more than one crafting piece, but the lizards do, and it's kind of nice. Uh, boat builders, one copy in the deck, costing us two of any suited crafting pieces. You treat rivers as paths. This is going to open up another option for crusading, which is nice, but that's about it, right? We don't need movement for anything else, and we don't need paths for any other interactions with our faction, we just move along them, and we don't move very often, so that's really about it. It's another why not craft, um, because it's a bird card, you're not going to discard it for outcast suit anyway, so if you're going to be discarding it, might as well just craft it instead. We could also craft to further secure any gardens that are on the river, right, so if no one else has the option to craft boat builders and the otters are not in the game, Think of a clearing like the top clearing on the autumn map, uh, sometimes referred to as Canada. That clearing that is rabbit suited, only connected to the top corner clearings. It's also connected to the river, so if a faction crafts boat builders, they now have easier access to that clearing, and we can just deny them the opportunity to do so at little cost to ourselves. Yeah, no opportunity cost because of the bird suit. Coffin makers, one copy in the deck costing us two rabbit crafting pieces to craft. Whenever any warriors would return to a supply, place them on this card instead. At the start of Birdsong, you score one point per five warriors here, then return all warriors here to their supplies. So our acolytes are now doubly useful since any that we spend will go to the coffin. This is a perfect time to trap opponents in a clearing with Sanctify, uh, provided we can d defend that garden reasonably well, or by using false orders to move warriors into a clearing with gardens. If we catch heat as a result of crafting, we can remind the table of our slow scoring pace, right? So they might not like that we're getting one to two points a turn from the coffins, but you can say, look, I'm really only scoring four points a turn. Am I really the biggest threat? You probably don't need to waste saboteurs on that, and you definitely don't need to kill any of my gardens just because I crafted this card. And maybe they actually do, but, you know, anything we can do to avoid catching any heat as a result of crafting this card. Soup Kitchens, one copy in the deck, costing us one crafting piece of each soup. Your tokens now count toward rule, and each of your tokens counts twice. Well, we can't craft this card because we can't have the outcast match all three suits, and we don't have tokens anyway, so we're just going to dom swap this card or use it to take the sacrifice action every single time. We're not going to, we can't do anything else with it, so we're not going to do anything else with it. And finally, I believe finally, we have arrived at Saboteurs, we have three copies in the deck, and it only costs us one crafting piece of any suit. At the start of Birdsong, may discard this card to discard an enemy's crafted card. So we can craft this no matter the outcast, as long as we have a single garden on the board, which is very easy to do. If we would overdraw, we should just always craft it. We can make others think twice before crafting improvements, and we can protect our own improvements. And lizards have the lowest opportunity cost of any faction for crafting saboteurs, right? Because it's a bird card. A lot of other factions have to decide, do we want to craft saboteurs, or do we want to use it as a bird card? Because bird cards are valuable to us. Bird cards are not valuable to the lizards. They much prefer the suited cards, so it's very easy for us to draw, uh, to just craft that saboteurs at the beginning of our evening phase. And that's it. Uh, like I mentioned uh, at the start of the video as well, we can uh, use this card to discard 
an opponent's card specifically to influence the outcast. That could be a, a nice little thing to consider. Um, but that that's about it for saboteurs, and that means that's about it for this video. Uh, thank you very much for watching. Um, I have this is I think the fifth crafting guide I've done. So if this is the first one you've seen, you can go check out the other ones that I've made for the cats, the Erie, the Woodland Alliance, and the Riverfolk Company. Uh, I also stream tabletop games of Root with my friends. I have a playlist of those streams if you'd like to check those out. Uh, and if you like my channel, if you like the content, uh, maybe hit the subscribe button. Uh, thanks very much for watching. I appreciate it. And I will see you all for my next video.